A while ago, I received a document with the title Historical Evidence of Tempe in the 18th and 19th century. The author of this document, for reasons he didn't explain, prefers to remain anonymous. The document collects data related of the durations of concerts, as well as playbills with standard pre-printed start and ending hour. About the reason as to why this document was made, the author is pretty clear. To assess the historical plausibility of the so-called double beat or whole beat theory about historical metronome indications as it is advocated by Wim Winters on his YouTube channel Authentic Sound. I first decided not to pay too much attention to a document that is truly problematic in every sense of the word, from an absence of any sorts of methodology to a problematic lack of critical self-assessment and objectivity. But since this document recently was used even in the hip department of a conservatory, it seems your poor servant doesn't have a choice but to spend time refuting what should have been the obvious to anyone thinking critically for just five seconds. It's telling, by the way, hip teachers use this document against the WBMP. It almost sounds as if they don't have anything else. So let's see if this document fulfills its promises. One of the fundamental requirements for any research or researcher is to make exactly clear what the research is about and more importantly, what not. So in the case you decide to collect historical data on durations, what exactly is the problem you want to solve? From what perspective do you collect these data? What do you hope to solve and why do you think, in this case, durations will be the answer to that particular problem? What methodology do you apply? How do you test the collected data on their reliability? Which data do you reject? Which do you keep and why? Can we see some examples of that elimination process? Has this subject been studied by others? And if not, why not? What does the literature say about your subject? By the way, where is the research overview in this document? Can you explain us why others did not see what you see and why? Does the literature point to a weak spot in your approach, in the sources you want to centralize? And if so, where do you mention that in your document? And if not, what literature did you consult? Indeed, if only this, where is the bibliography in this document to begin with? With just a little bit of reading, the author of this document would have discovered soon enough that already Dr. Martin Norden, not particularly on the whole beat side, I would say, wrote this in his 2016 thesis on Beethoven's tempo indications on the questions of durations. And I quote, There is evidence that there was a substantial difference between what Beethoven intended and what his contemporaries did. End of quote. Without a research history or methodology, a study like this is like a rudderless ship. All data and facts are kept so flexible that they prove on one page the exact opposite of what is claimed on another page. That might explain the relative online success of the document. Everyone can send the ship to the harbor of its choice. But before going any deeper, what made the author decide to stay anonymous? We need to know who you are. What is your background? Are you a musician? And if so, what kind of musician? What level, if you wish? Which instrument do you play? Or are we dealing with a musicologist? What education did you have? Where? When? Have you any experience in this subject? Or is this your first, your very first perhaps attempt to put something on paper? All cool, but we need to know. We need to know if we're reading the work of Professor Emeritus Doctor I'm Very Important or a paper written by a teenager in his bedroom. In both cases, professor or bedroom teenager, the decision to remain anonymous should have been a major signal to the reader 
and to that one particular hip teacher. If Mr. Fafner 1988 really was so sure about this case, why not fully own his work with all his first and second names? By staying anonymous, he leaves the back door open as the captain that will leave his ship first instead of last, leaving everyone else behind. But prove me wrong and we'll happily invite you as a guest on our brand new podcast. Next problem is this. An author opposing something should at least carefully describe what he opposes and why. A general reference to the whole B theory only, assuming everybody knows what it represents, is unacceptable in a document with this ambition. Of course, and here is the crux, there is an imminent risk that only by explaining the whole beat concept in detail, a large portion of the readers will immediately see the logic of it. I wonder if that hip teacher would distribute the document with as much energy when it contained a correct description of the WBMP. Next problem. If your ambition is to clarify historical metronomarchs with data on durations, you should make a constant connection between both. Any solution you present must come forth from that connection and that connection only. But in the entire document, there is nothing explaining the reader the oftentimes enormous speeds of plus 15, plus 20, even plus 25 notes a second. Instead, a connection is made with modern performances in the first place. And here, the study breaks with its promise made at the beginning, assess the plausibility of whole beat. The study doesn't deliver on that, but shifts immediately into a comparison between historical durations and modern performances. One has nothing to do with the other. In other words, there is no assessment of a whole bit theory at all. But that connection between historical data and modern performances is problematic on itself, something the author seems to be unaware of. The 19th century concert practice was completely different than our modern. Very rarely entire symphonies were played and even the habit of cuts within movements, something we cannot imagine today, was normal practice back then. I will happily come back to the durations of George Smart in the next segment, but even temporally, in his 1966 article writes that undocumented cuts make the entire set of data highly problematic. Not surprisingly, perhaps, Fafton 1988 quotes temporally speculated overview, but not his critical self-assessment. The number of variables impact the exact meaning of these durations is simply dazzling. Fafter 1988 may very well presume all data are exact representations of a program's duration, but that's beyond naive. If a Mozart opera was announced on a playbill from 1811 to last exactly three hours, I cannot prevent you from being happy for finding a modern performance that lasts exactly three hours as well. But how can we today still be sure the entire score was played in 1811? Just by assuming? Hoping? Well, simply assuming concerts in 1811 were comparable to concerts anno 2011 is a little bit too short-sighted. More on this single movement culture and cuts can be found in the extensive video I made on Beethoven's 1808 concert links here and in the description box. The reliable data on durations have one thing in common. Musicians in the 19th century played either in tempi very close to whole beat, faster or even much faster. Single beat tempi in documented concert durations, however, do not exist. It's ironic in a way that a study aiming at debunking the WBMP entirely depends on the existence of the WBMP to make any sense at all. That single beat is highly problematic is a conclusion in fact Fafner surprisingly makes himself. Not on page one, but almost hidden as a slip of the pen on page 62. And I quote, 
I do not wish to claim that this data shows that Beethoven's symphonies or the music by any other composer for that matter were always played strictly according to Beethoven's metronome indications in single beat during the, uh, during the early 19th century. The data clearly shows that they were not. The data indeed clearly show that they were not. And I wonder why. The undermining clearly, almost, was a Freudian slip, but this, unfortunately, from Mr. Fafner1818 at gmail.com, entirely correct. As I said before, if durations prove one thing, it is this, there wasn't a single beat universe to start with. But the best is now to come. Mr. Fafner does realize that very well himself. Enjoy this one moment of intellectual honesty on the same page 62, and I quote. No reasonable defender of single beat needs to claim that the metronome marks left by the composers must have been followed by all peoples at all times, nor do we need to invent some ad hoc theory of one three quarter beat or whatever in order to force the existing metronome indications into a perfect match with the known historical tempi. End of quote. But if the WBMP cannot be a solution, what's left? A three-quarter beat theory? Durations can be babbled into a superficial story that for the biased reader or the hip teacher looks coherent. But metronomarchs have no manipulative side. I'm well aware of the fact that Farfton 1988 makes a positive denial of his one three-quarter beat proposal, but he taps into the feeling of many. If only we could reduce these authentic metronomarchs by 25%, we would be fine. And he prepared his readers well. Why would anyone be forced to follow the composer's tempo all time? Isn't 25% slower good enough, if that matches your personal taste? I'm not so sure Mr. Fafner realizes how this clear admission of the metronomic problem exposes his entire mindset. It is here, on page 62, that he finally comes to admit the inescapable problem, since what he actually writes is this. Metronome marks are impossible, but if one comes to 75% of the projected speed, it's fine too. Unfortunately, his opinion is not important. We need quotations instead. Here are some that perhaps could help. Karl Czerny, introduction of his famous Opus 299, speeds up to 16 notes a second. I quote, The only condition is that after you have well exercised them, you play them every day prior to the others, in the marked tempo, observing besides the other rules of nicety and elegancy. End of quote. Or perhaps the preface of his daily exercises speeds up to 18 notes a second. Czerny would have this to say to Mr. Fafner. I quote, the present studies have only this purpose, and if the student practiced them daily with the marked repetitions and after knowing them perfectly in the time indicated by Melz's metronome. End of quote. It's not hard to understand, right? Or why not quoting Hummel's Pianoforte School of 1828? The metronome is one of the most useful inventions to music invented in the last years. It gives to the composer the big advantage by guaranteeing him that his works will be played anywhere, exactly in the tempo he wanted for his works. End of quote. Less famous, but even so clear about the true intention of historic metronome marks, we read in 1824 about John Parker. I quote. Thus in a country, even where the metronome is not known, and in future ages, in the event of the metronome being no longer in existence, the signature founded on the metronomic scale will serve as a record to trace the proper quickness of a composition as long as the sun keeps true to his present daily career. When Mr. Fafner really would have studied all these historical quotes, unbiased and objectively, how is it possible he came to this conclusion? No reasonable defender of single beat needs to claim that the metronome marks left by the composer must have been followed by all people at all times. Moreover, 
Why would the single beat option need reasonable defenders? What is reasonable anyway in the world of a metronome mark? And why do you need defenders? Do the facts suddenly not speak for themselves anymore? In the light of this one three quarter beat solution, it would have been interesting if Mr. Fafner gave the most famous metronome quote of history, that of Beethoven, left three months before his death. Metronome marks will follow soon. Wait for them. Certainly in our century they are necessary. Also, letters from Berlin inform me that the first performance of the symphony, number nine, by the way, took place with enthusiastic applause, which I attribute mainly to the metronome markings. Beethoven didn't ask for a one three quarter beat solution. And so if whole beat is a problem instead of a solution, the reader should at least know that the WBMP has been demonstrated. For instance, by playing the entire Beethoven sonatas exactly in the historic metronome marks, including the Hammerklavier sonata, something that this one hip teacher will never be able to repeat in a single bit universe. And this one three quarter beat solution isn't going to help him either. If I missed something, the podcast invitation stands forever. It's your call. There is a contact form on my new website. So what is it that we can learn from all of this? Reliable information on historical durations show a huge musical diversity during the 19th century something we already knew. Essentially, every source only says something about a particular moment in time, and that only for the very few sources we are absolutely certain about the entire context, the pieces that were played, the cuts made, and so on. They most certainly cannot question or explain metronomarchs. But durations are not used for that reason here. The ultimate conclusion the author wants to make, and with him many, durations show that metronome marks were not followed by 19th century performers. So if we today do not follow them either, our performances are closer to the historical truth than when we did. Point missing is that the 19th century virtuoso most of the times wasn't interested in the composer's intention either. And if this set of data prove anything, it's that music was played much faster than the given metronome marks. Either we accept that metronome marks were never accurate tempo indications, since many are impossible to play, or we assume that they were meant in whole beat, and most performers played a little too much faster than the composer intended. Up to you to decide which of the two conclusions makes sense. The point on durations is that even if we would have a document with timings that point to single beat, which is absolutely not the case, this would bring us back to the primary problem. If those durations would confirm single beat to be the only reading of the metronome, then we have to be able to play them. And we are not. And so the circle is full. I will definitely come back to durations. George Smart and Alcon to just name two sources. If you have specific wishes or questions for me in this regard, leave them in the comment box. Thanks for watching. See you soon again. Bye.